we're going to talk more about a forgery on the Zodiac Temple. I'm Rick Bennett. Hi, I'm Andrea from Lemoore, California, and you're watching Gospel Tangents, your best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. We're continuing our conversation with historian Melvin Johnson. We're going to talk more about the settlement in Texas and more about that temple in the Zodiac. It's really going to be a fun conversation. Mel will tell us about seeing the registers in the RLDS Church's archives. So that's going to be pretty amazing. We're also going to talk about a forgery, a recent forgery. Was it a Mark Hoffman? Check out our conversation. And somebody invited me out, and I don't remember who, to my first, it was RLDS then, Reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints, to their first John Whit, my first John Whitmer Historical Association Conference that September. I was very fortunate. I knew nothing about them. Yeah. And I had been an active LDS as a youth up until I was 30 or 31. So I had a fairly good understanding of LDS history as far as that which had been released in original documents. And so I'm excited and I go over to the RLDS archives there in the Temple Center. And I meet Ron Rogman, Romig, and Barbara Bernauer, and you should interview both of them yeah. as well. I know Ron. Ron's a good guy. Oh, he is. Ron Romig, in my opinion, is probably the number one bridge through the 90s and first part of this century in opening up a dialogue between the LDS and the RLDS, now Community of Christ. Anyway, I walked in, introduced myself, said, I'm researching the Lyman White colony. And he said, well, you need to look at the autobiography of John Hawley. Well, that's the first I had heard of John. <laughs> and then he says, and you also need to see the, re uh, the register of the Zodiac Temple records. Blew me away. So, so, so this register has like ceilings and things? In oh, it? oh, yeah. You have the ordinance. You have the officiator, you have the witnesses, you have the primary, you have the proxy, and the proxy for whom, and the dates. Oh, so they were doing proxy yeah. baptisms and sealing? Mm -hmm. and, and sealing. Now, because it sounds like the endowment is a lot different than the Nauvoo endowment. Is that, is that correct? I am not an expert on the Nauvoo endowment. And that's one of the next things that I do need to take a look at. What I'm going to do at Sunstone Conference this July, I am going to do a history, a chronology on chart from Kirtland to Nauvoo to Zodiac and then through the uh, George A. Smith's house to the endowment house so that we can follow uh, that which stays the same and gets developed and that which changes. Uh, I'm startled that nobody has ever done this before. Kirtland is an endowment of spiritual blessings. Uh, Zodiac is on ceilings through time and eternity, fusing the sacred and the profane. Uh, Nauvoo adds uh, rituals and rites, and they are developed further in Utah. John Pierce Hawley is important. He's the only man who compared and contrasted Zodiac and its rites and rituals with those of Utah, because he and his wife in 1857 got their endowments after Brigham Young had cleared them of white-eyed apostasy. And then in 1868, John received the second anointing and then assisted Apostle Erastus Snow 
in giving others. I'm trying to remember. So you, what was the first year you said in 1857? Yeah. Which is the year of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Is this St. George? Was St. George open clear back then? No. So they were down I, in the Washington Cotton Mission, which Washington, as you know, is just outside of where St. George is now. And uh, some poor souls for their sins were sent to Washington County to open the cotton mission. As you know, Brigham Young always had cotton fever on his mind. So John was one of the first, well, actually was in the first group to go to Washington. Well, I'm just trying to figure out where he got his endowment. Was that, was that in the endowment house in Salt Lake City then? And not in 1857. It would have been in George Albert Smith's home. Oh, in his house. So Either it wasn't even in a temple. house or across the street in the Lion House. In Salt Lake City? Yeah. Okay. And maybe... Because there was no temple in Utah in 1857. No, 1892. In Salt Lake. Salt City. Lake. When was I, I'm trying to remember when St. George was 1874. completed. 1874. Oh, 1874. So, okay. So essentially, what we're saying here is, between 1846 and 1874, at least in the LDS Church, there was no temple to do this, but they would do some of these ordinances outside the temple. Correct. On a on a case by case basis, essentially. Uh, and then, of course, the endowment house was built to be a bridge between that and when the temples came online. Orson Hyde was very jealous of that, so he had an endowment house built down in San Pete County. Oh, it, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, there were a number of them. And maybe the endowment house was built earlier than what I think, and I need to look at that for what I'm going to do for Sunstone this July. Yeah. This whole area, you think, would have been mapped out for ever ago, these interests, and they are not. They're well, I know, a, I know temple study, at least for active Mormons, is kind of a touchy subject, so I'm, I'm not too surprised that people haven't done a lot of <laughs> research on that. Jennifer Mackley, a wonderful temple-going LDS attorney from Portland, uh, she was the one who wrote that marvelous book, Wilfred Wood Woodruff and the Development of Temple Doctrine. And she and I came up with a presentation suggestion. We wanted to take a look at Kathleen Flake's article on the written canon going from oral to written. And apparently the powers that be for MHA this summer decided that was too close to the bone, mm -hmm. too close to the nerve, which it wasn't, but we weren't in charge of selecting the presentations. Hopefully, sooner or later, we'll be able to do it. It's a good presentation. What's interesting, going back to Independence and Ron Romig and those records, Ron stood up from behind his desk and he said, let me get you the register. And so he came on out in the hall and turned right. And there's a little anti-room down that hall then and walked in and there was this great iron vault. And I thought to myself, the vault of the first presidency in Salt Lake. And I chuckled and Ron looked at me as if I were a little bit weird. <laughs> he did not open the vault. The register was laying flat on the top of the vault with a couple of other registers on top of it. And he pulled it down and he blew the dust off of it and he opened it and you saw the attestation in the register by Lyman Young and then by the clerk of the temple, John Young, who was married to a sister. John was Brigham's brother, right? No. Oh, it's a different it's guy. It's a different Young altogether. Okay. And they had a John Taylor, too. but A different John Taylor. A different John Taylor. And John Young was married to one of uh, John Holly's sisters. And he was the one, it was his handwriting 
all through the register. Beautiful, lined, easy to follow, dates. I should put in a caution for the audience that there is supposedly, well, not supposedly, there is a forgery uh, called Zodiac Temple Records Rituals and Rites by John Hawley. And it's 32 pages written of these supposed rites and rituals in the Zodiac Temple. One, John Hawley was not the clerk of the temple. His brother-in-law, John Young, was. And secondly, Zodiac was like Kirtland and Nauvoo and early Utah in that all of the ritual and rite ceremony was oral. It was not written down until 1874 for the opening of the St. George Temple. So this register you're saying is a forgery, is it a Mark Hoffman forgery or somebody else? It is not a Mark Hoffman forgery. And I have suspicions uh, who wrote it. And I will leave it at that because I don't know that that is so. When was this recently, was this recently discovered? In the discovered? last two years. I first saw it years. online oh, okay. about two years ago. I have a copy of it. Uh -huh. But it's, uh, a, it's, how, do, how do we know it's a forgery? because the ordinances, rites, and rituals were not written down until 1874 okay. anywhere. So this is, a, this is a document that basically writes down the ceremony, and you're saying it wasn't written down? It was a created ceremony by the writer. Yeah, okay. Secondly, the writer says that it was John Pierce Holly that wrote it down. And, and this writer is just copying, supposedly. Holly was not the clerk of the temple. It was his bro John Young, his brother-in-law. And everything that we have to do, written, uh, is by John Young. So we've got some historical mistakes, essentially, with this document. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's a very generous way okay. of saying it. And I don't really want to focus on it, other than people should be aware that it's there and what it is. Okay. And, and this if is they're a, interested, sure. I've done a ton it. of stuff on the Mark Hoffman forgeries, so this is interesting that we've got new forgeries coming out. That I, I wasn't aware of that. Oh, so. yeah. Uh, Pan-Mormonism. 800 different denominations beginning as early as the late winter of 1830 when Joseph Smith runs into his first opposition. Um, Sure. Why would there not be forgeries? Why would there not be arguments? Uh, so I'm looking at it and he says, now you need to look at the autobiography of John P. Hawley. And what he does, he shows me the manuscript, but asks me to be very, very careful with it, uh, use gloves and not take pictures of it, but that I could compare it word for word, page by page, with a transcript copy a great grandson of John Pierce Holly did back in the late 70s and early 80s of the last century. And in it, you have his autobiography and in the Robert Hawley edition of the autobiography, he has the, what was that called? Leaves of John Hawley, Experiences of John Hawley, which was published in the Journal of History by the RLDS, probably late 1890s. I could be wrong on that date because uh, Holly was all over the place in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the later years. The autobiography stops in 84, and the experiences of John Holly 
start in 1885 and goes forward to last entries 1903 when he stopped his missionary work at the age of 76 for the RLDS. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with historian Melvin Johnson. In our next conversation, we'll talk a little bit about allegiances prior to the Civil War. Were the white settlers more inclined towards the Confederacy or the Union? And all of the Banderaites supported the Confederacy. So did the Mormons. They were very militant, very anti-Union. We'll have a transcript out shortly to our subscribers. If you'd like to subscribe and get a transcript, go to gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button. For $10, I'll give you a PDF. For $15, I'll give you a printed copy. You can also do that on patreon.com slash gospeltangents. So just go there as well. You can also get past interviews on our Amazon page. Go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you should be able to see those as well. Please like our page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents and you can get the latest updates there. Also, check our Twitter updates at gospeltangents.com. Be sure to subscribe on our Apple Podcasts page. Go to tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and you can subscribe on your iPhone or any Android device. So check that out. Now, for more great videos, click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some more of our great videos.